Hello there. This is Dr. Susan Gitao, your lecturer in trauma and trauma therapy. Lecture for signs and symptoms of trauma. Last time when we were discussing the signs and symptoms of trauma, we did part one of our video. And this is also a very significant video that I would call part two of our video session in lecture four. And it will, in most cases, focus on one area that is very significant in the understanding of trauma and how trauma ends up making us know something has changed. And uh, we talked about uh, the avoidance signs, we talked about the behavioral signs, we talked about how trauma affects us in our personal lives, career life, family life, home life, in totality. But maybe more important to focus on is how you can tell, even when it's not visible, that's what we call about the symptoms. It's something you cannot touch, you cannot see, but underlying something has changed. And that is why I would want in this uh, part two, we basically uh, go deeper into how trauma and brain relate during that particular period. The three-parted brain here I will discuss. I call the first brain part, <laughs> the lizard brain. I like to also call it the animal brain or the brainstem or the cerebellum. And in the discussion of stress, traumatic stress, in, in, in situations of crisis, situations of emergency, the autopilot brain marked in red is very, very active at that time. And so because it is either a fight or a flight mode way of brain functioning, when it comes to trauma, we talk about freezing. So in normal stress, normal emergency, you will have mostly fight and flight. But when we mention a traumatic experience, the individual freezes. And the freezing here does not refer to anything else. It refers to the freezing or the numbing of the brain, func brain functioning. And so when a traumatic incident happens, you may find somebody has numbed from the whole uh, uh, event, but they seem not to be feeling anything at that time. They feel like they are not thinking about anything at that time. And they could be in shock. They could be in denial. This is not all happening to me. And I like to give examples with myself because very many people in this world have gone through traumatic incidences. And there is this one particular time that uh, my friend and I were attacked by five uh, robbers uh, at gunpoint. And so the first time I saw the gun point at me like this, I thought it was a movie. Some of the movies I used to watch when I was young, Chuck Norris movies. But then again, something clicked to me. This is actually not Chuck Norris movie. This is me. And this is a gun. And this person is an enemy. Anytime they can pull the trigger, I'm gone. And at that particular moment, that reality that this gun, if triggered, I could die, I guess it was very deep kind of denial. And that immediately, the brain sends a signal. So at that time, I could not run away. At that time, I could not fight. And I guess I froze. And it's not the whole part of me that froze. There was a part of me that took a different direction altogether. How did I survive at that moment? I survived in a manner that up to date, when I look at what happened, I looked at see if I have calmed down, my voice changed, but there is something that was not tangible, but I tasted it, I felt it. 
that got into my mouth and there was really nothing physical and I swallowed that and it went and settled not on my upper stomach, you know, the one for food, but settled in the lower upper. And everything about me changed. The tone, the words I was using to these people. But it looked as if I was cooperating. It looked as if I was with them. But I believe now that was autopilot brain working. Because soon after that, I got very serious. Physical issues, emotional issues. And I had to keep seeing a doctor one day after another without knowing the connection was between the brain and my behavior and what followed. And not until after six months when the doctor got very tired of giving me medication, hormonal balancing medication, what we call hormonal replacement therapy and things were not working, he asked me whether I go through some abuse at home. I said, told him no. It hadn't really clicked to me. So when I am also teaching about trauma and the brain, even from my own experience, this happens. The brain can seem to just operate on another level. <laughs> Things seem to be working, but ideally you are depersonalized. So the autopilot brain can be going on. It's just like the way you can have the auto cars and the, even the ones we have for children. So even the brain, that is the autopilot brain. And for a while, it can bring some sanity because it makes you live like you are two in one until the reality hits. The mammal brain, this is the seat of our emotions, memories, habits, and attachments. And the limbic system, the seat of emotions. You may find somebody who used to be very stable emotionally. Now they have gotten into this uh, traumatic experience and from there going forward, this person who used to be a happy person, a joyful person, a peaceful person, all of a sudden becomes very irritable. This person becomes very edgy. This person can become overwhelmingly sad. This person can start losing taste of life. This person can form habits they never had before. For example, because the, the, the reminder of the trauma induces these negative feelings. And so the person who was never maybe taking alcohol, abusing other types of drugs, starts doing that. Mm -hmm. Someone who is not avoiding people because now with any trigger, negative feelings come in. The limbic system is activated negatively. So this person might form totally new habit. I have seen people, survivors of rape, becoming obsessive, compulsively, involved and indulged in cleanliness, even other behaviors of washing their hands, you know, and it's in a very uh, compulsive, obsessive manner. And so the limbic system is also fractured during traumatic experiences. What about attachments? You can imagine if it's a particular gender or a particular person or a a representation symbolically of whatever may be traumatized to you. Like I have seen people who may not want to attach with men, maybe the abuse somebody went through, it was perpetrated by a man. And so any attachment towards men becomes fractured and cut off. And it can also be the reverse. It can also be particular people in the workplace. It can be your boss, maybe they betrayed you, maybe something happened. And every time the word boss is mentioned, or any time you see someone who looks like your boss, emotionally, immediately, you are affected. And that is why the DSM-5, uh, when it was revised in 2013, trauma was set apart from other stressors. And they basically added cluster uh, of signs and symptoms, D, where they were looking at the recurrent negative thoughts and emotions. And so I pick emotions. That since the incident happened, the emotions, even if someone is happy, 
So for a short time, the negative emotion set. And so somebody's life looks like it's ever a distressing life. And so when you go see a doctor, if you don't share with them about your trauma narrative, what happened to you, they may treat you the same way they would treat someone who has depression. And maybe one day it might be discovered it's not that you had clinical depression. You basically went through a traumatic incident that changed your emotional well-being. I am not saying the autopilot brain, the mammal brain, were placed there not to protect you, not to be used by you. Because there are times autopilot brain has saved people from maybe harm, danger. Because the autopilot brain, when it reacts very fast, for some people, they are able to avoid maybe an accident with their car. They are able to instinctively sense danger ahead and they can divert whatever is going on even quickly, maybe when water falls from maybe a boiling pot, you may find yourself jacking very fast and the water poured down. So there are times the autopilot brain in its own way can protect us, even in some traumatic incidents. I want to imagine when I look at my incidents, even if I got problems later, maybe that time if I was very good with trauma, with high level awareness, I would have gotten psychological debriefing immediately that uh, we are going to discuss later, but it reduces uh, development of severe psychological signs and symptoms, but I did not know. But even at that time, when I felt and I sensed like I have swallowed something, I could tell the texture is like the yolk of an egg and it has gone down and then everything else changed. That was the autopilot brain's way of protecting me from the reality that these are firemen, we're only two ladies, and they are all armed, they are wounded, can't even tell who exactly they may be. They are speaking in a language that uh, you cannot identify, especially when we identify here in Africa with their ethnic groups. It was not easy. But at that time, I was sad. And now we do have the neocortex brain, the human brain, the part of the brain that sets us apart from all the animals in the world. Maybe the primates that get close to us here are actually um, the family of uh, uh, the primates called the monkeys, the baboons, the bonobos. Yeah, and they still don't come close to us as such. So the human brain is the one that is responsible for language construction, what to say, when to say, how to say it, speech, abstract thinking, where you can be able to think beyond what you can see, try to process some thoughts and some maybe uh, faces or some concepts, imagination, consciousness, reasoning and rationalizing. Now, during a traumatic event, this can be very destructive. Someone who's been known to be very smart breaks down because the only thing they can do at that particular moment is not think can't think straight. They can't think about a way out. And this is very sad because when some people recall how they reacted during the traumatic event, they always imagine, maybe I could have done better. And so it takes them back to fractured mammal brain, feeling guilty. And when they feel guilty about the incident, any trigger can also take them back to the lizard brain, where automatically you may think of harming yourself and you feel stuck, you feel head there, and you can't move. And so it's very, very important to know that the normal functioning and operation, especially in this higher order thinking, if somebody, even our children, 
even our teenagers in schools, even the young adults in colleges. Sometimes we may find someone who used to be very organized, someone who used to reason very well, someone who used to be very creative, who are good in decision making, who are good in problem solving. But following a traumatic incident, this person has totally changed. And to some extent, you may have people having memory loss. They cannot remember very significant uh, aspects of the traumatic incident. And, and this is a bit uh, frustrating because you feel like you're trapped in your own body, trapped in your own brain. You feel helpless, helpless. you can't move on. You can't understand what happened to me. I used to have very good concentration. I used to have very good attention. What happened to me? The brain was fractured. So very, very important that we be able uh, to understand this part of our brain that is fractured highly by traumatic incidences. Now, Remember I talked about the brain being fractured, whether it's for a child, whether it is for an adult, a teenager, a young adult. And if you can remember when I talked about personal trauma in our lecture three, conducting your own inventory of trauma incidences, we were looking basically at, at different developmental stages. If somebody went through a traumatic incident, what is likely to happen? Now look at the brain that is supposed to develop normally. What happens right now? So that we can be able to understand ourselves if traumatic incidents happen in our lives. Those of us who are already counselors, those of us who are planning to work with traumatized populations, you can't be able to make sense of what we are discussing right now. Trauma and brain development. Very hidden symptom. Sometimes you see signs of somebody behaving this way, but the symptoms are subtle because even the changes in our brain, unless we behave in a certain way, some people may not pick exactly what happened or what's going on. This is the same breed I have brought here with different, of course, names like when you talk about reptilian brain, that's why you talk about a lizard is a reptile, right? The limbic system here, it is the emotional brain. We have the neocortex, the thinking brain. And so if you look at our normal way of surviving and developing, if you look at the first triangle, or pyramid, it is upside down. A typical development you will find when you are normal in terms of functioning in your brain, your cognition is high notch and you can think logically, you can reason, you can problem solve, you can decide with all options taken into consideration. You have a systematic way of maybe handling things. You can process information in a very functional way to arrive at a very good conclusion. Highest level. Social emotional can follow. And we need to attach with other people. We are not an island. We need to live with other people in harmony. Family, work, social. But you may find now these two going hand in hand. You become a fearful person, someone who is full of anxiety. You don't trust people, so you read the truth. I remember I used to see people with black or even a cape. And if I cannot like make out a face, like now dark people. And because I could also tell the way these people are talking were young people. I would go and see young people everywhere, even in the, in the gas station. And I'm thinking maybe these are the ones who harassed us. These are the ones who took our money and our property. So you feel like you are detached from these people. 
Yet it's because the trauma changed the way of thinking. So you became irrational and you start operating at that level. Then we have the regulation, you know? Talk about regulation, it's very key that whatever happens to us, whether it's a thought level, especially emotional also, is there some balance that is happening? Emotional intelligence is it there. So you find in the real sense at the end of the day, what now becomes a very, very important uh, to someone uh, who typically develops is that survival is the most uh, limited or deactivated. You're not living for survival. You are not operating on the autopilot brain because that's where now at survival mode, survival for the fittest, where most animals use just to survive in the jungle. So you can imagine beyond trauma that somebody's brain is fractured and all that they are doing is to survive in this life. It can be very distressed. But living a day after the trauma, it's by the grace of God, or what people may say, a higher power. It's like every day you've lost, every day you lost direction because your brain is not balanced anymore. You're just surviving. You're no longer living. Or since then, you live on that numbing moon. Or since that time, you're always hyper-aroused. You're always hyper-stressed, waiting for anything to happen. Tell me, when will that kind of a person be organized? When will that kind of a person be logical, plan their lives? So if you look at uh, developmental trauma now, that's why for me, I tell people, I really worry about children. Because if trauma happens when they are very young and nothing is done, no tra trauma healing, no trauma treatment, no trauma recovery, no psychological debriefing was done, and this child grows. And if trauma is not processed, unless they are taken through some practices like we are going to discuss later in our lectures, our follow-up lectures, like mindfulness, or those who know about meditation, those who know, who know about the biofeedback relaxation method. But it's good to be trauma-focused because when it's trauma-focused, then it targets that trauma. And so the reverse now happens such that what takes the biggest chunk of the brain's development and functioning is survival. As you can see, a typical development or a normal development, survival is small. But when you come to developmental trauma now, you are able to survive. Connect this to you, you can see. And so the pyramid has started. And so what takes the biggest chunk of your brain is to survive. You keep fighting to regulate your emotions. You keep fighting to bring a balance in your life. You are ever on that a lot more. Today I know I'll go to the workplace. I know I'll get into loggerheads with my boss. I know I'll collide with my colleagues. I know there'll be nothing good enough for me. Hmm? And so you keep regulating even the way you navigate life, the way you think, and you don't seem to get like a breakthrough. Then the social and emotional cause also diminishes. And then your cognition diminishes completely. And so if your cognition, the thinking brain is highly fractured, that is why sometimes we have seen people early change. There are people who have totally, totally have had their speech impaired, their hearing impaired, their taste buds impaired. Think about all the five senses, the touch. And now we come to the way we think. And so always the first thing you thought, the minute you're traumatized, like the fear of death, 
thinking you're going to die sticks. And so every day you're like writing away <laughs> that you might die. Every day, all that is on your mind is something you always see as very dangerous. You are ever on that alert mode. You are ever withdrawing from people. You are ever emotionally weak or damaged. You are ever fighting, fighting, fighting for balance. You are ever on survival mode. And the worst that happens is that when your developmental trauma pyramid looks like this, many other areas of an individual's life is affected. And so even if I'm going to end this session today talking specifically about the brain and the trauma, I would like to let you know as a counselor, it's good to know the brain gets affected during trauma and it doesn't just get engaged to fight or take a flight, the brain freezes. And it's the work of a counselor to process, especially the information that could have been lost, information that could have been miscontrolled, information that could have been changed negatively into rationalization irrationalization during a traumatic incident? Was there exaggeration? Was there what we call a generalization? Has this client developed automatic thoughts that are negative, automatic emotions that are negative, automatic understanding of relationships, withdrawal, detachment, insecure attachment, automatic response to external pressure. Thank you very much. You've been good company and I believe you can read further and especially if you read the brain and trauma. Thank you very much. This has been part two of our video, lecture four, signs and symptoms, trauma. Thank you and be blessed. I would like you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Susan Guitar, where you will access mental health tips every week, every month, every year. Thank you.